and it was the American Educational Researchers Association. This is a group of people that spend their life asking research questions, questioning the status quo, questioning each other, questioning research methods, and I would just never forget, it was the, the presentation that Michael did was so different from anything I had ever heard at AERA. Not only that, but when he opened it to questions, he handled the questions of those researchers in ways that I had never seen done before either. And I thought, I need to learn more about who this person is. And so I looked him up <laughs> and found out um, that he's a distinguished fellow with the Clayton Christian Institute and that that institute has been all about innovation. And I saw him again speaking to a group of educators much like you all in Colorado back in February. Marcia and I were there. And when he presented, as he was going through his presentation, I thought, oh my gosh, we need to hear this in Arkansas. How do I do it? And so we worked on bringing Michael to Arkansas. It's his first trip to Arkansas. We, we planned perfect weather for him. Michael is the author of several books. If you've ever read the book, Disrupting Class, that is one of his. He also has the book, Blended, Using Disruptive Innovation to Improve Schools. We have several signed copies that we'll be giving away with your little, at the back of your, your check-in name tag, you should have a little red um, door prize tag. But I'm excited for you to hear him, and then we'll go from there. He's going to speak with us, and then he'll do a short question and answer, and we'll go from there. Michael, would you please welcome with me Michael Horn. moment of truth. Can I get the microphone on? Uh, thank you all so much. It's, it's really a pleasure for me to be uh, in Arkansas with all of you. It, as, as Denise mentioned, uh, it's my first time here. And I, I will say, uh, flying in on a uh, historical night of, of the first presidential debate last night, it felt really good to fly into the uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton National Airport. Um, so uh, I, it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here, as I mentioned. And what I wanted to do today uh, is thank you very much. Um, is uh, talk through hopefully in not uh, deep research terms. I think what Denise was politely saying is that he poses as a researcher, but sometimes he's more on the ground with educators, and he was just trying to get by with those research crowd. But um, but uh, but what I really wanted to talk to you about uh, was this movement that we see sweeping across not just the country, quite frankly, but the world right now of this opportunity to innovate in education. And I think that the uh, phrase, Commissioner, that you've chosen, student-focused education, is actually one of the most eloquent ways I've, I've heard it put of really focusing on each and every single individual student to help each and every single one succeed and realize their dreams. And what I hope to do today is, yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about the themes from, from the book Blended. Uh, using disruptive innovation uh, to, to improve schools that, that myself and Heather Staker wrote. But I actually don't want to focus just on blended learning itself for its own sake, but more about the design methodology uh, behind uh, getting to a solution that might be blended learning for your, for your students, but really about that design methodology as a way to help you think as we're innovating to serve each and every single student how do we harness this design methodology to give some structure to that innovation process so that innovation isn't just throwing a bunch of wacky things at a wall and hoping one of them sticks and, gee, that's the thing. It turns out that in our research on innovation over the last 20-some years, we've realized that there's actually a set of rules that you can follow to make innovation far more predictable and successful such that it does not need to be just this crapshoot of I hope something sticks and works. And so that, that's really what I want to uh, talk to you about today, is that process itself and give you a way to walk through the efforts at your local schools and in your districts to really drive toward this future that Arkansas, quite frankly, I think, intends to pioneer and be a leader in. And I think that's a very exciting uh, moment, not just in the state, but I think it will prove to be one for the country as well. And the country is really in an interesting uh, crossroads, I might say. 
we have this unbelievable opportunity to innovate. And I think it's because of two distinct trends that are hitting at the same time. One is from technology that is changing the way pedagogy can actually happen in the classroom with students. And at the same time, the policy environment has dramatically changed, and I would say opened up, such that it is welcoming for the first time in many, many years innovation focused on each and every single student. First on the technology. The appearance of online learning, broadly speaking, uh, in the 1990s really created this opportunity to innovate. In Disrupting Class, the, the first book that I, I co-authored with Clayton Christensen, the father of disruptive innovation theory, most of my middle school teachers thought it was my autobiography when it came out, it turns out. But we made this crazy prediction that by 2019, 50% of all high school courses would be delivered online in some form or fashion. That seemed absolutely insane in 2008 when we made that prediction. Now it seems much more realistic. And I think we'll be right plus or minus a couple years on either side of that prediction. But I think what's really interesting is not the prediction, but that online learning gives us this opportunity to innovate and to innovate such that every student succeeds. That's why we do innovation. Innovation for its own sake is just as meaningless as technology for its own sake. It's got to be for a purpose. And combining it now with the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, that really creates this policy context in which they're interested in each and every single student and quite frankly have given a lot of power to states. And I hope that states will give a lot of power to districts and schools to figure out the right way to serve your population is a huge opportunity combined with each other. And from my way of thinking, online learning makes a few things possible at scale. The first is, quite frankly, blended learning. The fact that online learning uh, is not a distance phenomenon or a virtual learning phenomenon, it's, that's certainly a small part of it. But really what online learning is doing is blending itself into our schools to change the possibilities for educators in reaching all their students. And so in 2010, uh, Heather Staker and I went about and, and created a definition for what is blended learning because this term started to pop up all over the place. And if you remember, for those of you that travel around to various education conferences, in 2010, this really broken debate uh, uh, started appearing where educators would get up on stage and say, I'm blended learning and you're not. And it wasn't a terribly productive debate because the really interesting debate is how are you using blended learning to achieve your educational goals, right? But we just decided to create a definition with working with uh, 150 educators to just try to move us past that. And so the, de the definition I'm about to give you is a little bit technical, uh, but I'll simplify it in a moment. The first part of it has got to be a formal education program in which the student is learning at least in part through online learning, and this is the important part, where they have some element of control over the time the place, the path, and or the pace of learning. It's got to be some pedagogical shift. The second part is it's got to be, at least in part, in a supervised brick and mortar location away from home. That's fancy speak for schools with teachers. And then the third part is that the different experiences that a student has have to be connected in some way. And what I mean by that is that within any given subject, what you do online has to connect to what you're doing offline. So in the 1980s when I was in school and a teacher would kick me out to do Oregon Trail. How many people remember Oregon Trail? Yeah, okay, good, good, good. So that wasn't blended learning, it turns out. The number of squirrels I killed, that had nothing to do with math that I was trying to accomplish in the class, right? It was a distraction, a, a babysitting tool. Um, so in other words, what you're doing online has to connect to that offline experience and vice versa. That's blended learning. It's got to create a coherent educational experience. And so importantly, that means just shoving a, uh, an electronic whiteboard in front of students and beaming online curriculum at them, that's not blended learning. You haven't shifted the time, place, path, or pace of the learning. And I will tell you the instructional model shift is way, way, way more important than any technology you will use. Similarly, it's not just shoving uh, digital textbooks or one-to-one -one laptops in the environment. Those can be important enablers of blended learning. But just because you have those devices doesn't mean you've made that instructional shift itself. 
One other thing. You'll notice in my definition that I don't say blended learning is good, because it's not always. Blended learning can be enormously valuable for reaching every single student, but it isn't necess necessarily good. And you can go around the country and see a lot of crummy blended learning experiences. Really important. It's how you use it. And so the big question is, why blend? And from my standpoint, it's really to personalize, to be able to reach each and every single student along their particular learning need, their particular learning trajectory. Because we all have different learning needs at different times. Some students grab onto a particular concept very quickly. Some people struggle with the concept much more slowly. They really need to work with it until they master it or understand it. And the reason for this, as cognitive scientists have informed us, is we all have different working memory capacities. Literally, the aptitudes in the front of our brain to absorb visual and aural information and process it in active memory. And we all have different long-term memories or background experiences that we bring into an educational experience. And what that means is that if a teacher is talking about a particular concept, or right now I'm talking about something, and I use a phrase or a term that's unfamiliar to you, the human brain's natural instinct is to glom onto that phrase, remain fixated on it as the lesson moves on. The salient point's over here, but we remain stuck over here. And because of this, we need to be able to offer customized learning experiences to help every student succeed. And the benefits of online or blended learning is that every single student can really move at their different paces, take different pathways to have material explained in different ways, to work and create material in different ways. This is a screenshot from the Khan Academy. How many pe people familiar with that? Almost everyone, so I'm going to make the cardinal sin of assuming everyone. Um, Khan Academy, this is from a fifth grade classroom in Los Altos, California. You can literally see the individual trajectory of every single child in this classroom. What's really interesting is the student highlighted in blue, if you were to zoom in on that student at the beginning of uh, fifth grade class, in the beginning of the year, day zero, he was third from the bottom of his particular class. Turned out he wasn't weak in math, though. He just had a few misunderstandings from much earlier in his math learning, back when he was in second, third grade. He went back into his math training all the way back in there, filled in those holes. And by the time the screenshot ends in day 70 of, this, of the uh, school, that student was third or fourth from the top in his particular math class. In the traditional math system, we would have labeled that student a slow learner. We would have given it a fancy name, obviously, for the group, like butterflies or something. And uh, that student would not have seen algebra until high school, never seen calculus, would have impacted his college and career choices. That's educational malpractice. We don't need to do that anymore. Students are not fixed in their abilities. They sometimes need a little bit more time to fill in those holes and then they can start to soar once they find their passions. I'll tell you another reason for blending. I think it starts to create competency-based learning at scale. Okay? Competency-based learning is this notion that today's system is a fixed time variable learning system. What do I mean by that? Right now we deliver content for students, we test and assess, students progress to the next grade, subject, unit, whatever it might be, and only afterward receive their results. If they fail, or if they got a C, meaning that they missed 30 percent of the material, too bad. Creates the hole, they move on, they fall further behind as we keep uh, progressing. Competency-based, sorry, this creates a Swiss cheese problem in education. Students develop holes in their education. And the real difficulty as a teacher with 30 students in front of you is you know all your students have holes, you have no idea which students have which holes. And the ability to fill it in as you're supposed to lockstep through the curriculum is almost impossible. Flip this on its head, competency-based learning, where the learning becomes fixed and time becomes the variable. So we still offer learning experiences to students. We still test and assess, because it turns out testing and assessment is an important part of learning. But now we get real-time or interactive feedback that informs what students do next and students only progress to the next grade, subject, body, material after they've truly achieved mastery of the given competency. This is a definition of high quality competency-based learning from a site called Competency Works that you can look up online. The really big takeaway that I want you to have from this 
is not to read all the words. That's a cardinal sin also of PowerPoint making. But actually, I want to focus on the assessment, the third bullet there, that assessment is meaningful and a positive learning experience for students. This is really important because I think what ESSA, so now we've been talking about the technology, now let's talk about the policy environment. ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, is opening up the possibilities for assessments in ways that we have not had since No Child Left Behind started in 2001. What we're able to do is start to move to a world where we don't have just a summative assessment at the end of the year, but really systems of assessments. And I think the future of assessments, and I invite you to push this envelope with all of us, because we're all innovating and creating the future here, is going to be assessments that are far smaller than large, large nine-hour assessments at the end of a grade. Assessments that take a two-week testing window. We're going to move beyond that, much smaller assessments. They're going to be much more frequent. They're going to ha be happening almost daily, I think, as students are constantly moving through their learning experiences, constantly helping us understand where are they in their learning, where do they need more support, where do we need to move backward just to help them out, and quite frankly, they're going to cut through this artificial divide we've historically had in education between formative assessments on the one hand, those that are for learning, and summative assessments on the other, which are of learning. If you talk to a psychometrician, and I suspect there were many at the uh, conference we were at, Denise, um, they will tell you it's impossible for a test to be both for and of learning. Totally disagree. That's true if you're in the factory model time-based system. If you move to a competency-based system, though, by definition, every assessment is both for and of learning because you do not make progress unless you have demonstrated mastery. That's of learning. By the same token, every time I'm assessed, it's giving me information on what I need as a learner for, for the teacher with me. And that's helping me understand how to reach each and every single student. So we cut through this false debate and everything is both for and of learning. And I will tell you right now, that is a way more transparent and accountable system than the one right now where we have where we test once a year and somehow think we have a complete picture of where students are in their learning. No possible way a nine hour test captures all that's happened in the course of a year. This is gonna be way better and way fairer to teachers as well. One case study for you from the world of higher ed that I think is really interesting, which is this university called Western Governors University. People know that? Okay, a handful. So this is an online competency-based university that was created by the 20 Western governors in the 1990s. Now serves 60, 70,000 students or so a year. Um, and the way that they've done assessments is quite clever, I think. They've divided assessments into two categories. One is what they call objective assessments. These are things that the machine can score because they're multiple choice or just short answer, right, wrong answers. Takes that load off of the teacher. They don't have to worry about that. Computer can handle it. But we also know that objective assessments only go so far. So they also have performance assessments, and they think about those differently. These are the projects, the real life work examples that you want to see from your students where you really get in. What's interesting is that they don't have the teacher of record, if you will, grading those performance assessments. They have a whole other separate faculty whose sole job is to be schooled in the art of grading performance-based assessments. And this does two things. One, you get really good expertise on how to grade performance assessments. The second thing it does is it eliminates the, I didn't master that or I, didn't, uh, I, I got failed because my teacher did not like me. Eliminates that pressure completely because you know what? Your teacher who's grading that doesn't even know you. They're just judging your work product. Really interesting way to do it. And I'm not recommending that the K-12 system just adopt that wholesale. I suspect that would be expensive. But I am saying, let's think creatively about different options for assessments. Because it is important that we keep the rigor bar high, but that we innovate so we get out of the box we're trapped in. And I think that ESSA gives, starts to give us that space. I hope that the folks in Washington, D.C. don't as they're doing the regulations right now, <laughs> hamstring us right now with lots of regulations. And it's not looking like they're going to be too kind. But let's, we're going to keep pushing on that, I think, all of us together, to give us the space to innovate that we need. And what I'd encourage State Departments of Education to do here as well 
is help the districts come up with the solutions for what these futures of assessments look like. No one has the answer right now. So let's do a lot of tests, figure out what works, and keep moving forward, and really focus on the outcomes for student learning. And I would say those outcomes aren't just academic ones. Social and emotional learning outcomes are really important too. Grit, perseverance, we're hearing a lot about. Student agency, the ability to be a lifelong learner and make decisions for yourself. Really, really important as we think about what success looks like. So thinking about assessments and outcomes and reporting in a broad way. Now, just one note on this. Angela Duckworth, who's written a lot about grit and perseverance, has been very clear that the assessments that are out there around grit and perseverance are not at all to be used as an accountability tool or on state uh, reporting. I totally get that and agree with that, but I also think that if you move to competency-based learning, grit and perseverance will be embedded in your education system because students will not move on until they've truly mastered something, which means that they will have to keep working and show effort at something until they've truly mastered something. Whereas right now, you can sit in class and the next day you come back and the teacher's talking about something different, you've made progress even if you haven't actually learned anything. So I think competency-based learning really shifts this conversation in some pretty profound ways. And I will say that these are very important concepts for developing in students, no doubt about it. But we cannot get there from the factory model system. We have to move to a competency-based learning system to tackle these things. How, now, how do we get there? And this is the really, sort of that was the preamble, if you will, to my, to my uh, remarks. But how do we get there? I think none of us knows what this future really looks like, if we're being honest. And quite frankly, I think it looks different in every single school across America based on the population and circumstances that they're serving, the regional economy, all sorts of things that you're trying to achieve. I don't think school should look the same everywhere across the country, in other words. And so I'd encourage you to treat it really as a design problem where we're all going to have to iterate, throw ideas out there and learn from our mistakes and try to achieve what we hope is that student-focused education system in the future. And so what I thought I would do is uh, give you this design methodology from Blended um, as a way to help us fulfill the potential of this moment. Because I don't think ultimately, although I hope the regulators in Washington help us, <laughs> I think ultimately whether we fulfill the potential of this moment is in the hands of each and every one of you on the ground with students every single day. That's, that's how we're going to realize this potential. And so, I want to give you this design methodology that's from the book, and I'm going to illustrate it a little bit through implementing blended learning, but the reality is you can use this design methodology to attack any problem that you're facing, whether that's one of designing a scorecard for outcomes, redesigning a learning environment, trying to figure out ways to get certain classes in your district that you couldn't otherwise offer, whatever it is, this can be a really helpful design methodology. And as you're doing the workshops and innovating over the rest of this day, I hope it'll be useful to give you some structure for that process. So the first part of innovating is starting with what we say, choose a smart rallying cry. And what we mean by that is brainstorming. What are the problems that you're trying to solve, the goals that you're trying to achieve, the opportunities you are trying to seize? And be very deliberate about listing those out. This is where I think Arkansas really is right now. We're in the smart rallying cry period. And then once you've identified those problems, goals, and opportunities, define what success would look like against each of them. We're calling it a smart rallying cry. Specific, measurable. Be very clear around what success looks like. So if, if in your particular school, for example, you're trying to boost the learning outcomes for say, fourth grade readers, put a percentage on it in a time by which you want to realize it. Be very specific and measurable, not so that there's a metric hanging over you, but to build consensus among your team in your district around what success looks like and if you're on your way to what success is. The second step that I think we all too often forget is organizing the team to innovate against this problem, to design this problem. Often we treat innovation as a whoever's in the room exercise or a solitary thing, when really, when really it's a team problem. 
getting the right people on your team is really, really critical. In the book, we gave a way to sort of think through the different types of teams for different types of problems you might face. But the big idea is don't put uh, a really big bureaucratic team against a problem that a teacher can solve in his or her individual classroom, and you're just going to create a lot of bureaucracy for that teacher to realize the goal. So a quick example would be, say, science teachers want more time for uh, labs in, in their school, OK? You actually don't, they can flip their classrooms to do that. You don't actually need a huge team from the district to sit there weighing all the different things that you're going to need to do. By the same token, say the problem is one of really reconfiguring how the school works, the schedule, moving beyond block scheduling or 45-minute period scheduling or something like that. If you just task individual teachers to do that, they don't have the power, the levers of control to make those design changes. So you need a bigger team from across the district to tackle that sort of a problem. So creating the right type of team to solve the right type of problem, really important. And I would encourage you to think broadly. Think about the community and parents and so forth, including them on this. Not always because they'll have the best ideas, but they might. They might surprise you. But also because it'll build buy-in over the longer term for the changes that you're making that may start small and over time will grow. Third piece is then starting with, OK, what does the student experience in the ideal need to look like such that we can realize uh, and, and accomplish our SMART goal? OK? And to, to tackle this design, the student experience, what I would encourage you to do is really think through what will motivate students to want to come to school and tackle the work that you have planned out for them or that you've created the opportunity for them to tackle in a really energetic, excited way? How do you make them excited about being there? And so what I thought I would do here is just uh, walk into some of our work on innovation and give you a theory for thinking about how to tackle what motivates people. And it turns out that um, motivation is a problem that is not just a struggle for schools to solve with regards to students. It's something that afflicts literally almost every organization in our society. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to move into just a couple business analogies just to demonstrate the point about how bad businesses are at, are at understanding customer motivation. And then I'll move over to schools, OK? So businesses are all the time trying to figure out how do we motivate customers to buy what we're building and what we're selling, right? And they're really, really bad at it. Despite all the advent of big data and whatever else, well over 75% of new products and services that are launched in the market fail every single year. 75%, OK? And our sense for why this is is that most companies frame the market uh, that they're working in by, custo by customer demographic, so white males age 35 to 49, in my case with kids, or by product category. So in the car market, for example, you'll have small compact cars, SUVs, minivans, and so forth. And they'll look out at the market and they'll see very clear data. We have this percent of market share of this average demographic compared to Toyota or Ford or whomever. But the problem is that from the perspective of the individual user or customer, the world isn't structured by demographics or product categories at all. Instead, you just have situations arise in your life problems maybe you got to solve, things you're trying to accomplish, progress you're trying to make. And you hire different products or services to help you make that progress in your life. And so what you're really trying to understand is the situation, what we call the job to be done of the individual. And that's what creates causality, understanding the job that someone has to do. And those don't always align to the average demographic or product category. So I'll give you a silly example from the 1990s from a uh, fast food chain uh, that wanted to improve the sale of milkshakes, a real public uh, policy problem of their time um, for many different reasons. But uh, they wanted to improve the sale of milkshakes. And so they did what most companies do, which was to bring the average demographic most likely to buy milkshakes into focus groups and ask them, how should we improve the milkshake? got very clear feedback, made changes. Sales did not budge one bit. So they got rid of those guys that had helped them do, do that work. And they brought in a different group from uh, Detroit, Michigan, actually, who had this different question on their mind. I wonder what job 
people hire a milkshake to do? Sounds like a silly question, and to some extent it's supposed to be for this. Uh, but instead of asking customers how to improve the sale of milkshakes, what these researchers from Michigan did was they just stood in the back of the restaurant one day for literally 18 hours and took copious notes of any time someone came in to buy a milkshake. What time of day was it? What were they wearing? What else did they buy? Did they drink the milkshake inside the restaurant or go outside and drive off with milkshake in hand? On and on and on. And at the end of the day, they saw a few interesting things. 80% of milkshakes were sold at two times during the day. 50% of those were in the early morning rush hour commute. Pretty gross, right? 30% were in the late afternoon. Of the 50% group, every single one of them came in by themselves, bought nothing but the milkshake, and every single one of them walked out to their car, drove off, slurping down the milkshake in their hand. Every single one of them. So the next day, these guys came back, and instead of uh, standing in the back of the restaurant this time, they stood outside the restaurant. And as people left with the milkshake in hand, they confronted them, not to do an intervention, <laughs> but in language, maybe they should have, but in language that they would understand, they said, excuse me, when you just hired that milkshake, what job were you trying to do? And they got some pretty bizarre looks, right? <laughs> and they said, um, think about the last time you were in this situation, doing whatever you're doing right now. What else did you buy to help you accomplish this? And they said, you know, you're kind of strange, but um, I think I know what you're getting at. You see, I have this long commute to work right now, 20, 30, 40 minutes, and I'm not particularly hungry right now, but I know if I don't put something in my stomach, I'll be starving by 9.30. And this work uh, commute has always been kind of boring, so I just want to keep, you know, uh, have something that keeps me awake, keeps me alive, you know, so I don't get bored during it. And come to think of it, I hired bagels last week. But take it from me, bagels don't do this job well at all. Because they're dry and tasteless unless you live in New York City, in which case you don't actually drive. And uh, to make them taste good, you got to spread cream cheese and jam on them. And that means you're driving with your knees. And if the cell phone rings, man, you got major problems. I hired donuts a few weeks ago. But those didn't do the job well at all either, because I had to lie to my wife that I had hired donuts for breakfast. And it wasn't a very believable lie, because when she got in the car later that evening, the steering wheel was all gummy and sticky from the donuts, and she saw right through it. I hired bananas once, but this was actually the worst thing of all, because the stupid banana was gone in 30 seconds, so I was bored for the entire drive to work, and I was starving by 9.45. But it turns out, that when I come into this restaurant and I hire milkshakes, it just does the job perfectly. Because the thing is so thick and viscous, it takes forever to suck up that tiny little straw that it easily lasts me my 20 or 30 minute drive to work. No idea what they put in this stupid milkshake. If it's healthy or not, I actually don't care. Because it sinks to the bottom of my stomach and easily keeps me full throughout the morning. And you know, God always gave me two hands. I always drove with one, never knew what to do with this hand. But there's a cup holder here, and the milkshake just fits in perfectly. So it turned out that the milkshake did the morning rush hour commute job better than its competitors, which weren't just milkshakes from McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, and so forth, but all of those, plus bagels, donuts, coffee, Snickers bars, bananas, you name it. So understanding what the job was really helped you understand the dimensions of, uh, of improvement that you had to make to really motivate people to want this experience. And uh, just actually to let you know, the late afternoon job that people were hiring was the same demographic of people coming in, but now they were coming in as parents with their kids. And you'd buy the Happy Meal or whatever it was with your kid, and then you'd get the tug on your jacket, Dad, can't I have a milkshake? And you hired it to feel like a good parent. Except in this case, it didn't make you feel like a good parent at all, because the thing was so thick and viscous to suck up the tiny straw that you'd sit there waiting patiently for a few minutes while the kid worked at it. Then you'd sit there waiting impatiently, and finally you'd say, son, daughter, whatever, we got to go. And you'd throw the thing out half consumed, and a temper tantrum would result, and you felt like a crummy parent by the end of the experience. You called me into a focus group and say, how do you improve the sale of milkshakes? What do I tell you? 
because I hired for two very different jobs in my life. Now, it turns out that as we turn our attention to schools, school is not a job that students have in their lives. This probably is not news to any educator, but instead it's something that they can hire, if you will, and I don't mean with money, I mean with the, where they want to spend their time and their motivation to help get their jobs done, but it's not the job. Their jobs are really at a high level. They want to experience success and make progress every single day of their lives. And they want to have fun with friends for the most part. And school is one thing that can help them do those jobs, but it's not the only thing. School competes against video games, athletics, arts, gangs, dropping out and cruising around town. Quite frankly, it competes against boredom as well. And it doesn't do a particularly good job against those things. Because the way we've designed school is to make a lot of students feel like failures. Every three to four weeks are the opportunities to have success. And assessments are not such that everyone is supposed to be successful on them. Quite frankly, when students are having fun with friends, we tell them to shut up. That they're not supposed to be doing those things a lot of times. When they do have fun with friends or when they experience success on the athletic fields or in the arts, we call those extracurricular activities. We artificially separate them from what students are trying to accomplish. And so for many, many students, school does not do their jobs particularly well. And they disengage and become demotivated. I would actually would say no student is unmotivated. Just school isn't something that fills their job. Every student is motivated to feel success and make progress. Now, how do we design an experience to really help deal with this motivation we say that there's three levels in the architecture of a job. The bottom one is the job itself, and it's not just the functional dimensions of it, but the emotional and social dimensions too. The second one is, what are the experiences that we have to provide to get this job done really, really well? And then the final layer is understanding those experiences. What do we have to provide and how do we have to integrate it to get that done? So what I mean by that in the morning milkshake, or excuse me, the morning uh, rush hour commute job, you'd make the milkshake thicker. Right? So to make sure that it would last through out the uh, drive. You'd, uh, you'd uh, bring the, uh, front of the, uh, the, the dispenser to the front of the line and give people a prepaid swipe card so they can dash in, gas up, and get on their way right back in their car. They want to get moving. And the third thing you'd do is you'd stir in tiny fruit chunks, not to make the milkshake healthy, because they do not care about it being healthy. They were very explicit about that. But so instead, that they'd be driving along, and every once in a while, go swallow up a piece of fruit and say, gee, that was interesting. And it would keep them awake. True story. You have a Panera or Jamba Juice milkshake, you'll see. So uh, this, this is how you really design against it to create a great student experience as well. And so I want to just give a case study to walk through how one school in California, Summit Public Schools, which is now actually offering its platform for free to any school anywhere, uh, is, is accomplishing this, and not to hold this up as the way you should do it, because I don't think it's right for every school, to be very honest, but I think it's a very thoughtful way that they did it. They first started with, what are our educational goals? And they're trying to help students achieve lifelong success. So to do that, they said, we have to imbue students with content knowledge. We've got to develop habits of success in students. We have to give them experiences outside of school, so they understand the purpose of school. And fourth, we have to give them the cognitive skills, social and emotional learning and so forth, to be successful as adults when they go out into the real world. To do that, Summit said we have to help students feel successful and make progress and have fun with friends. And there are at least eight experiences that they provide to help them do that while accomplishing Summit's own SMART goals. The first one is student agency giving students choice and ownership over the educational decisions that they make and how they uh, choose to learn concepts. Individual mastery. Students do not move on until they've mastered something, which embeds success in the cycle. Access to actionable data and rapid feedback. So students can become the owners of what success means and drive their own learning. Transparency and learning goals so that the picture of what success looks like is very clear up front, and not just for a given year, but actually for all four years of high school. Fifth, sustained periods of quiet, solitary reading time. This is unique to Summit, but a lot of their students didn't have these opportunities at home to read in quiet. And to be successful, they needed these periods of time. So they, they, they said this is a really critical experience. 
Sixth, meaningful work experience uh, both in and outside of the school day so, uh, for that fun with friends piece, actually, sorry. And then mentoring experiences, fun with friends and success. And then eight, positive group experiences, fun with friends. And to accomplish these experiences, they then built with Facebook this personalized learning playlist platform, which, like I said, is free to everyone, to help uh, give every student an individual playlist on their road to mastery. Every student goes through this learning uh, cycle e each and every single week. They set their learning goal. They plan how they're going to get it. They learn. They show evidence of their learning. And then they reflect on the experience and repeat. This helps develop that agency piece so that students are really owning their learning. Uh, they make the entire scope and sequence through graduation transparent so every single student knows on every single day how are they doing on the road to graduation. They give rich, transparent feedback through various tools so students can get immediate ideas and, and, and really rich ideas, quite frankly, of what they need to do better. This is the day in the life of the Summit student. They've totally torn apart the schedule such that you can see there's huge blocks of, uh, of project-based learning time, which embeds the working with uh, uh, friends in the course of the work itself. Also, what they've done is you see on Fridays, every student spends um, most, of, um, uh, most of the day doing the personalized learning time on, on the uh, per personalized learning playlist platform, um, and then gets discrete times with their mentor, 10, 20 minutes every single Friday, just to make sure that there's constant mentorship opportunities. And the other thing they've done is you see the um, sustained quiet reading time in there every single day, such that students have that opportunity to really do deep reading. And then they've created eight weeks per year where students get off campus and go out into the community on internships and externships with various companies, uh, community organizations, and so forth to actually really do rich work in the community with other people and get a sense of a need to know of why, why school is actually mattering for their futures. The other thing this does is create eight weeks per year of professional development time for their teachers, which it turns out is a pretty, pretty exciting benefit of it. That's just how they've tackled student experience. Then the teacher experience is the uh, next piece of this, really thinking about two aspects of it. The first is, what's the best use of face-to-face -face time in this era of technology? And I would say it's increasingly not doing what I'm doing, which is lecturing. It's much more having a student, uh, excuse me, a teacher move, if you will, to that facilitator role and play a bunch of different roles around mentorship for individual students facilitating projects and rich Socratic discussions, tutoring individual students or in small groups, evaluating work, student work in rich, rich ways, and counseling students on all the non-academic problems that trip them up that receive way too short shrift in our education system. And then the other piece of this is finding ways to motivate teachers too, understanding their jobs to be done and how do you create great experiences for them. And so, uh, growth, responsibility, advancement are really critical pillars for teachers to be able to teach to the top of their craft and continue to make progress themselves. So these are some things we're seeing teams do around the country to uh, help accomplish that. Extending the reach of great teachers, allowing them to become master teachers, work with more students, specialization for those teachers that want to go deep on a particular aspect of teaching. Team teaching, and I don't mean like teaching in teams, sort of like a sixth grade team, but literally knocking down walls between classrooms and having teachers in, a, in the same room with 100 kids working together, bouncing off each other in exciting ways throughout the day. That really changes the profession in some interesting ways. Awards for achievement, micro-credentials, as you make your own personalized progress on your own learning journey of being a great teacher and granting more and more authority to teachers to design the experiences as makes sense for their students. Now, from that teacher experience, I'm going to whip through the rest of this design methodology just to give some time for Q&A. The next step is, what is the content, the technology, and the facilities we need to bring to bear to deliver on that teaching and student ideal experience that will realize our SMART goal? you'll notice that content and technology has come really far into this design process. Okay, and that's very intentional. This is the step in the design process that will bring you back to reality from your big lofty dreams in the student and teacher experience. But this is where the give and take happens of where do we really need technology to help us and where is it a distraction? 
And I would encourage you to really always think about technology as being in service of a learning goal, not for its own sake. Don't get distracted by the gee whiz things, but make it in, in uh, pursuit of that learning experience, okay? And so I just want to mention a couple things on this. In the book, we give a lot of frameworks for thinking through these steps, but 12 considerations when picking software that I just want to point out just to help you think through um, as, you're, as you're designing. Really, what is the inventory you already have in place? Do you need full-time uh, curriculum or do you need supplemental that will supplement what a teacher is doing? Obviously, price, the student experience, how adaptable or assignable is it? What kind of teacher control, in other words, is it giving it versus just making its own decisions in a black box? Really trying to parse through those is really important. Data, efficacy, flexibility, compatibility, alignment, provisioning, single sign-on such that students can use multiple programs. The one thing I will tell you is there is no silver bullet educational software out there does not exist, I don't think it ever will exist. And so what you're trying to do as educators is patch together different options, technology being a piece of it, that will fill in the student experience to deliver on the SMART goal. And these are just some considerations and things to ask various folks that you work with, whether that's software vendors or open education resources, to really make sure you're delivering on the type of student experience you want to provide. Now, the other piece that I just want to focus on here is what's the best use of brick and mortar space? Because I think all too often we get trapped in thinking that a classroom has to look a certain way with the teacher at the front of the room and that's just the way it is because that's the way it's been. And I would say that really, so the starting table stakes for, for thinking about brick and mortar space is that it's obviously got to be safe and clean, but we should be really much more thinking about inspiring spaces that are available and flexible for students to meet these different needs and to really personalize for where they are. And I actually, when I was running the Clayton Christensen Institute, um, I forbid my team from using the word classroom to describe these future learning spaces because I think that traps us into sort of this four-wall mindset and, um, and doesn't allow us to dream about what learning spaces might be like in the future. So if you're building a new school in your district, I would think beyond the egg crate classroom design and double-barreled hallways that have always dominated school design and think what could we do differently. And if you're working in an existing school, think about how you can hack your space to make it really different and lively and exciting for students and to give them the set of experiences that they need. This is just one set of pictures from a school uh, in Chicago, intrinsic schools, um, that had the opportunity to redesign school space from scratch. And they created a very neat school that cost basically a third uh, of the price of a traditional school per square foot of instruction. And it actually, I think it was doubled the uh, instructional square foot uh, footprint by really reducing a lot of the hallway spaces and things like that that take away from instructional space in a school. And you can see they created a very cool set of spaces to support the different modalities of learning that students would have. Now, from there, in the blended learning taxonomy, you would choose, you know, you'd really lock into an instructional model that made sense based on all these things. Um, and so I thought I'd just quickly whip through what these different models of blended learning are, just to sort of give you a sense of what the taxonomy looks like. But I don't want to harp on this for two reasons. One, educators are innovating all the time and creating new models of instruction. And this is just a way to sort of visualize. And then the second reason is I don't, again, I want this design process to be something you can use for any innovation attempts you're doing, not just for creating blended learning. Um, and so at the top there of this confusing chart, brick and mortar schools meet online learning and they have a baby whose name is blended learning. And then blended learning has a bunch of offspring, a bunch of different instructional models. And so the first one is a station rotation model. Basically, the centers-based learning that's been occurring in elementary schools for years and years and years. Now one of those stations is online learning, and students are rotating between these different activities. And the introduction of the online learning station allows teachers to much more frequently regroup students in a dynamic way, such that you're not tracking students at any one point in time. This is what it looks like in a classroom in uh, Los Angeles, California, where you can see the students on the rug in small group instruction with a teacher. There's 10 students there in that particular case, another 10 uh, in the back uh, learning online, and another 10 students doing some collaborative projects together. Lab rotation model, basically the same idea, but if you can't get computers into your classroom, you can potentially get them into a computer lab and do the rotations there. 
Flipped classroom model, raise your hand if you're tired of this phrase. Oh, come on. So, Flipped classroom is basically you flip what happens in the classroom traditionally, um, the lecturing and so forth, you flip that to the homework, and the homework, the practice, the problems, the projects, that goes in the classroom so you can be working with your teachers and your peers in a much more active way together um, on, on, on what you're learning. Individual rotation, basic idea is the same as the station rotation, except that every single student has an individualized playlist. And so some students might do multiple rotations of online learning in a given day. Some students might never hop on a computer because they just need more time to do their projects. Every 35 minutes, say, they might rotate, but they're going to be following their own individual schedule that can change from day to day and week to week. This is what teachers are often doing in these uh, activities is working one-on-one -on -one with students or leading very intimate small group discussions and things of that nature. Flex model, very similar. That's what Summit Public Schools essentially uses, where every student has uh, a lot of autonomy and flexibility to make the decisions for their education that makes sense for where they are in their own learning trajectories. Um, this is a very difficult model, I will say, to pull off sometimes, because you're giving a lot of agency and choice uh, to students. Build the culture such that you can realize this and, and really have success. This is what it looks like in Summit Public Schools. It looks a little bit like the modern workforces that you start to see in a lot of technology companies, in Google, Facebook, things like this. Re while it's difficult to pull off, it's pretty exciting. It starts to build uh, that future of work and learning in, in the same place. A la carte model is simply offering online courses with online teachers where you can't maybe offer this, uh, the class uh, with an with a in-person teacher. What I will tell you is the research is becoming very clear that students are way more successful in these virtual class environments when they have an in-person experience with a mentor who may not be the teacher of record, but is there with them to guide them in their learning, keep them on task, and help motivate them. So Quakertown Public Schools in Pennsylvania created a cyber lounge where students would do their online classes alongside their peers, alongside other teachers, such that it cr uh, created an environment for students to be successful. The research is becoming pretty clear about this. Um, last one is enriched virtual model. You hear about the growth of full-time virtual schools, and I would submit that those are an important educational option for students, but they are not going to be the future for the majority of students. And uh, most students still need that brick and mortar place to come on a weekly basis to be with their peers and teachers. And so that's what that essentially is. From there, You've designed your basic experience. I would say you're now thinking about implementation, and um, I'll just leave you with a couple thoughts. One is really, really focus on the culture that you want in your school. And what I mean by culture is not some airy-fairy definition of culture, but really the processes, the habits, the priorities that people unconsciously or subconsciously choose to exhibit on a daily basis. This is really important as you start to innovate and create a more student-focused culture because as you start to give more autonomy to students, teachers as well, quite frankly, the decisions that they make on a daily basis have to reflect the ideals that you're trying to drive toward. And students need to be able to make good decisions. And so having clear expectations about what hard work looks like, about how people ask questions, about how you have conversations, is really, really important so that you don't accelerate a bad culture and make it really bad versus taking a good culture and making it great as you innovate. Last thought is that whatever you do as you come out of, the, out of, the, uh, out of this process is not going to be perfect day one. I've never seen innovation be perfect day one. It's always an iteration process. And so in the last chapter of the book, we talk about discovery-driven planning. Basically, what are all the assumptions you're making in your design that have to prove true for you to be successful, and then test and learn about those assumptions as rapidly as possible. That could be as simple as calling up a neighboring school that's already done the innovation and learning from them about how it's worked. That could be as simple as trying something in summer school where the stakes are a lot lower before you implement it across the school. That could be trying it in one classroom or one grade level and then rolling it out year by year over five years such that you can really test and learn and then adjust your design, because I'll tell you right now, you want to experience fast failure. You do not want to experience spectacular failure that drives headlines and papers about incompetence, wastes human capital, and wastes money.
That's not what you want to have happen. But fast failure is absolutely critical to learning and innovating. And if you don't have it, you won't get to that success state that you ultimately want to have. I'll tell you one other thing, which is that fast failure is actually what we want to model for students. We want to help students understand that failure is part of the learning and creating cycle. And so us exhibiting and learning from fast failure is a huge opportunity to model for students what lifelong learning looks like, to help them see these are the qualities, these are the traits that we're trying to help you imbue to become a successful adult in our society, not just in the workforce, but in society broadly speaking, civically, in work, and to make great decisions in your own personal lives and in your communities. It's a huge opportunity that I think you have before you. I think blended learning will be a big part of it, but I don't think it'll be the only part of it. And I hope that this design methodology really gives you a big picture way to think through the different uh, innovations and in designing that you're doing right now to truly create that student-focused environment such that each and every single student succeeds. I'm a uh, father to, um, to twins right now. I see my friend Maria Worthen there, who's a newly, new, new parent as well. And um, she's from Mine Call. that's been a great thought partner in this work over the years. And uh, I'll tell you, we depend on what you all do on the ground as educators. We're, we, we need your help. We need your support as you keep innovating to prioritize the lives of each and every single student. They're really precious, these kids. And I know that we can unleash their creativity to create a better tomorrow. Thank you so much for your time today, and I'm excited to have some question and answer with you. Thank you. Question. And don't be bashful if you have disagreements or questions. I'm open to both. So. Oh, come on now. I, I heard Arkansas is not shy. I know. <laughs> Questions, challenges, thoughts? So I've been very motivated and challenged already uh, by the experience uh, this weekend, or this week, and I have a uh, child who is uh, 13 and a 15-year-old. So I went home last night and I began quizzing them. Uh, if you could do, if you could learn any way you wanted to learn, what would that look like? What would you do differently? How was school today? What did you do? What was engaging? What was interesting? And I got blank stares. <laughs> they didn't even know what to do with that. You know, yeah. they, they, they couldn't even articulate to me. Uh, they, they could tell me that it wasn't terribly engaging and that they weren't terribly interested, but they couldn't really articulate even to me what would help. So how do you, in shaping the culture, what kind of recommendations do you have for school leaders, those who are trying to bring along stakeholders, parents, even the students themselves, to, uh, to really envision that kind of end goal? Yeah, you know? it's a great question, and I'm, I'm really glad you asked it that way. Um, a few thoughts. One. There's a terrible meme that's out there, and I just, I, I'm using your question to make this point, and then I'll answer the question directly, but that it's sort of this technology versus teachers thing, right? That somehow technology might replace teachers. We need teachers to create these experiences and to help um, open up the opportunities for students. They're not going away, and in fact, they become more important in these environments in the future. It actually elevates their practice, and I think you demonstrated why, which is that just as in innovation in business, asking the customer what he or she wants is a futile exercise, so too is it sometimes in schools. And, and I don't want to say that student voice doesn't matter, because I actually think students can be very articulate about elements of an experience and what works and what doesn't, and they can help be creators or co-creators of an educational experience. I don't want to diminish that, but the research is actually quite clear that when you ask customers what they want, blank stares or answers that actually do not correspond to what they actually will use is in fact often what happens. And the milkshake example illustrates that very clearly in the jobs to be done. When you did the focus groups and said how to improve the sale of milkshakes, they would give clear feedback or they'd give blank stares. 
um, but they weren't actually corresponding to what would truly motivate them to help understand this. And so, um, I, uh, and, and sorry, two other thoughts. Uh, Steve Jobs famously said this as well, right, when he was designing different experiences in, in, in Apple. And it, whenever he came out with a new product, people would famously pan it only to see that it was a remarkable success most of the time. He was an unbelievable, astute observer of human behavior to see what were they actually trying, what was the progress they were actually trying to make in their lives, and what could he imagine that would open up their opportunities to make that progress. And then Henry Ford also famously, maybe not so famously, um, said it when he said, if I'd asked people what they would have wanted, they would have said a faster horse, right? And so uh, creating the car, though, was a, a, and, and w was a leap for them. So I think that's actually very consistent, what you're observing um, in, in these. And I think the other thing is, when you've been in an education system for 10 years, nine years, that's been structured in a very particular way, what do you expect them to say? They don't know any better. They don't, they've never been put in charge of their own learning to be able to make those decisions. Um, and that's why, uh, to some extent, some people say, oh, is the younger teachers come into the teaching force and are digital natives, quote unquote, this shift to student-focused or student-centered learning will just happen naturally. I, I don't think that's true. I think we're going to have to be more deliberate about it. So what do you do with it? To understand what are the jobs that people truly have in their lives and the experiences needed to help them accomplish those, you really need to, A, be a very keen observer, watching what they do, not what they say. See where the roadblocks are in their daily lives. What are the workarounds that they do for those roadblocks? How do they use teachers or technologies or textbooks or anything in unexpected creative ways to help them solve problems? Those moments of struggle and the creativity that they show in solving them will give you so much more insight into how to design experiences in very different ways that will start to unlock what this could look like. Second thing, if you're not always in schools and don't always have the fortune of chronicling what students actually are experiencing in their lives and always observing, you can do conversations with students, but much more to ask them to reflect and describe on their frustrations help see the movie. Basically, you're trying to construct a movie of how they confront those moments of struggle and how they resolve them. What are the forces that are acting on them so that you can see the opportunities for innovation? And then the third one is spot the areas of what we call non-consumption, where students are not able to do something that they want to achieve, um, or the school is not able to offer a certain experience that you think would be exciting those are often areas for innovation to take root and solve those jobs. So those are sort of three ideas. Um, Heather Staker and I are actually at work right now on a workbook um, against Blended right now that the publisher tells us will be out in May. We have to hit some deadlines for that to happen. But, um, uh, and we're trying to think through what are the six or seven techniques you can use to elicit those ideas right now. But those are three that I think will get you pretty far down the road of seeing those opportunities. And then what I think will happen is you start to open that up for students, they'll start to become more contributors of what did and didn't work to the experience and start to sketch out ideas themselves. They, when we ask someone who doesn't have the right to dream what they want, it's very difficult to answer. But as they start to have the opportunities to dream and start to realize what they're trying to, to do and start to see education as something that's for them, not something done to them, I think you'll start to see that they will become more articulate over time as well in surprising ways. Last point, which is we actually know a fair amount from learning sciences now that we didn't know 20 years ago. We actually know a fair amount about motivation, how the brain works, and what excites people about experiences and so forth. Having an experience you know, competency-based learning, for example, where, and where you're constantly offering students learning experiences just above their level of mastery. This is actually something that's been known for much longer, but we actually have really good research now. And having assessments be things where uh, they can do something with the information. It's not just data that they can't act on it. These are unbelievable ways to start to create opportunities to incite motivation and really get them engaged in the learning experience. So there are a lot of things we can start to put in place to, um, to ignite that in students and then start to see where it takes us. So we actually know a fair amount from the research that we can bring to bear 
uh, in redesigning these learning environments as well to start to kickstart us uh, down the road. And then I, the last thing I think is important is that not all students are the same. They're not all going to respond to the same things. And so having that student focus, that personalization, I think is really important because I, whenever someone says to me, and, and I mean this both ways, you know, uh, memorizing X is really, really important, I think for some students it might be, but not all students. Whenever someone says to me project-based learning is the way to go for everything, I get equally suspicious. I think it works in some cases and not others, and you got to, and I think it depends upon the learning experience as well, and you've got to be constantly figuring that out for different students and creating an environment that can truly customize for those differences is really, really important. I, I hope, hopefully that's helpful. Other questions? Come on. Oh. <laughs> Get my coming across, coming across. I'll get my workout this morning. <laughs> Um, we are a new school of innovation, so we've really worked on the personalized learning piece. But one of the barriers that we have um, not crossed and have actually put off is, you know, these students having a period of respite where the, we're required to give them a grade, yeah. you know. But yet, they, we know the potential they have. The students don't, do not always understand that potential because They've had some grades that have not been uh, good. So, yeah. but we need a time, you know, to work on that. So, how do you balance? And I know it's, I mean, we know that it's going to take us a few years to get the community involved on, okay, no, we, we want more competency based reporting to parents, but yet we still have to give that child a grade. So, we're having a, a really, that's a, that is a struggle for us to overcome. Yeah, you're not, and you're not unique in that struggle. Um, I would say as a lot of, one of the biggest questions I get from schools trying to move to a competency-based learning system is what about the community often? Because they still want grades or, or still require grades or whatever else. Um, and there's no, there's no one size fits all answer on this either. Every community is different. I think a, a few resources. One, if you know the book Delivering on the Promise about the uh, experience in, um, Chugach, Alaska, um, about how they involved the community in their move to competency-based learning. I think it's a very valuable resource to think about how, uh, to learn from how they did that. That's one thing I would say. A second is you can actually still use grades potentially and not move away from that. Yes, a competency-based learning grading is different, but you could do an A, B, or try again sort of system and still give grades to to. Um, students and help reorient the community over time um, to be thinking about, uh, you know, some of the biggest pushback from these grading system comes from parents who uh, they want their kids to get the A and no one else to get it. Um, it's like the study, um, you know, there was a study years ago that said, would you like to have um, $75,000 a year if everyone else had $75,000? Or would you like to have $50,000 if you knew everyone else would get $25,000? And everyone else, and everyone says $50,000 with $25,000. Um, uh, so that relative, I mean, that's a human nature thing that we're dealing with. Um, I think you can start to orient people to two things. One, it, everyone's going to make mastery. Um, and so your student has the opportunity to differentiate themselves based on the depth they might go in that mastery or based on how rapid their progress might be and, and, and how deep, uh, you know, how fast they might go or how they might find something after mastering the core. They might find something that's really passionate for them and go super deep into them. And that's what will actually differentiate themselves in life, not the fact that they got a 4.0. Um, and I, I mean, I, you know, once you're five years into the workplace, who asks for your GPA? Um, and so I, I think trying to recraft it that way is important. And then the, the last thing is, I, to the extent you can, I'd really try not to make it about grades. I'd really try to explain to the community what you're actually trying to accomplish and make grades be the by byproduct of it. And I'll just tell you one story. Um, from my own experience that, that, that may be useful in this, which is um, a number of years ago, I, I was in an airport, I think in Memphis, when I got a frantic call from my mom. I grew up in Montgomery County, Maryland, and um, there had been an article 
in the Washington Post uh, about how a school in Montgomery County, Maryland was switching away from A, B, C, D, E grading and to uh, a competency-based learning grading. They didn't use that word. They just said, you know, uh, proficient, needs more work, yeah, et cetera. And um, she called me up and said, can you believe what they're doing to dumb down education again? And I rate. And she went on a tirade for about 20 minutes. And I listened and I listened. And at the end, I said, you know, Mom, I think this is kind of what I work on and advocate for. <laughs> But it occurred to me that the story was exclusively about grading and not at all about any learning changes that were occurring. And so what probably had happened was that they hadn't explained or brought in the community at the beginning and just sort of said, like, these grades are getting changed, the grading system's getting changed. And then that's what a parent complained to the Washington Post, and that was the article they got written. And so who knows? Maybe that's literally all they were doing. But I suspect that there was more. And that just hadn't been communicated in a thoughtful, deep way so that you really had built some consensus across. And so I think that really speaks to the importance of getting community and really thinking about messaging and communications not as like a nice to have marketing glitz, but as actually a core part of your strategy that you need to have in place to be successful. Um, the Learning Accelerator and some other groups have put out resources around how to think about this communication piece. I'd recommend looking at that. Um, and then so too, I think there's some wisdom in starting small, getting buy-in from the group of parents there. It's easier to communicate to a smaller group. And then expanding big um, and having a multi-year plan as opposed to just like tomorrow we're switching it and everyone's expected to sort of know what's going on. Because that's, that's tough. So trying to find pockets where you can build support, I think, are, are, are important. And ho hopefully those are just some ideas that, that, that help you think through that. But, but a lot of sympathy for this, because I think it is a big it's a big switch for the community. And when you think about organizing the team in that second step, that's actually one of the biggest things I think about is having some people on board with that that can be real pillars to explaining and communicating that in the community, because otherwise you can really get tripped up there. Great question. Maybe time for one or two more. Other questions? That made me think of the importance of the ambassadors in the ESSA stakeholder engagement work. That's a big part of it. Got a couple back there. We have been talking in, at our school about schools within schools. Mm -hmm. um, went to Ken's session yesterday, saw what is going on in Salt Lake. It's wonderful. Yep. I'm so bought in. I'm not asking this question as a, a negative of, you know, we can't do this because we're large. But, you know, Ken's school, he said he had about 400 students. We have a high school of almost 3,000. And we are really struggling with what does this look like for us. So I would like your opinion on doing this school-wide versus starting out schools within schools? Yeah, I, it's a great question. I think comprehensive high schools are probably the hardest place to, to, to do. It's easy to do this work in comprehensive high schools on the fringes, because there's tons of what I, again, would call non-consumption. Courses you'd like to offer, APs, advanced courses, credit recovery, dropout recovery. There's tons of opportunities on the fringes. To cross over into the core is very, very difficult. And so I, I think about it from sort of three lenses. One, I love the schools within schools idea. I'm a huge proponent of that. I think creating spaces for innovation that are outside of the mainstream, really, really important. So I'm a big fan of that and, and helping you make it smaller so that you can go big later. Um, I would say don't get trapped in the pilot mentality. So pilot is often a, the equivalent of a four letter word against innovation. Um, where you, where you sort of do it just to make it stay small and it never grows. So have a plan for how you're going to keep unfolding year after year to bring more and more to the community in it. Um, even if you change that plan, I think just having it there is really important so everyone knows what the intent is. Um, the third thing is I would use those different areas, like the credit recovery, the advanced courses you wish you could have offered, the scheduling conflicts you can offer, as, as opportunities to innovate as well within the core school. And then I would push teachers to do the sim quote unquote simple flipping classrooms and things like that. Because in high school, I think that's often what this innovation is going to look like for a long time um, you know, w within a comprehensive high school. And, and that's something teachers can do, get their heads around it, and then start asking bigger questions as you're doing the school within a school bigger set of experiments and, or innovations. And what I mean by that, is um, 
I, just a quick example, I, there, there was a school in, um, I want to say Oakland, I can't even remember anymore, where a teacher had moved to, in this case, a station rotation model, but was still lesson planning to deliver the same lesson for the class every single day. And what you started to see was very quickly, students started to diverge, right? They were in very different places in their learning, and yet every single day she would come in and deliver the same lesson plan. And then a couple months in, she started asking herself, why am I lesson planning for an entire class with 30 students who are all at different places in their learning? Why, why am I still doing that? And she started breaking it up a little bit. And then you know, she started taking steps over the course of a year to change her instructional philosophy and really get out of the pacing guide mentality. And I think as you start to flip the classroom, you start to ask a lot of those questions too of like, should we all be doing the same thing? What's the right experience for so-and-so versus that? Now you have attention that the state is often asking you to cover a year's worth of curriculum. And so these are gonna be the balances that you have to make in the conversations I think you should be having with the State Department and, and don't be afraid to raise them because the sooner you raise them, the sooner you'll start to figure it out and see where the relief is in the regulation and things like that to make this work. But those are a few of the things that I would do so that both the core, if you will, is innovating as well, but you're also able to do that school within a school thing where you're maybe able to do the bigger innovations that have the bigger idea of where you wanna go. Hopefully that's helped. I, I, I totally agree. I think comprehensive high schools are really probably the hardest place to pull this off though. This is a real quick one. Uh, there are some of us that might want to use your milkshake story. <laughs> is that written somewhere? Can we borrow it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it's written. Um, uh, some people would say too much. Um, uh, so, so it's in Blended. Um, it's in Disrupting Class. There's a new book that Clay Christensen just wrote that will be out October 4th called Competing Against Luck. Um, which has that story and many, many more around jobs and many techniques of how to realize a job that I would highly recommend um, that'll be coming out soon. And then I'll just do one other plug for y'all because I'm pretty excited about it right now. My next book that I'm writing um, is about applying the jobs to be done methodology to why students choose college and what mo motivates them to think, uh, choose college. Um, and we've done uh, 108 interviews with students really deep, like hour long, interviews, got about 20,000 data points so far in, in, in a pretty giant uh, set of documents now. But, um, and we are finding some really interesting things that are very counterintuitive around why students choose um, uh, college. That's been just fascinating to us. So that'll be coming out probably in a year or two, but it may also be interesting because it's obviously focused at a different end, but I think it'll have applicability because what you think we always hypothesize, you know, students choose college to get a job or something like that. It's like job is not present. Um, it's a component, but it's not a, it's not the job. And it's really interesting to watch, um, what, it, it, to learn from from what we're seeing right now in these student stories. So, just some ideas for you that it's it's out there a lot of places. I'm on YouTube too much, probably telling about it. Clay is as well. So there's a lot of ways you can pull it in, for free. So. Guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.